Welcome to the Ben Don't Break podcast. I'm Aaron Schweitzer, publisher of The Source Weekly with our ethereal and multi-talented co-host, Laurel Bronze. This podcast is powered by The Source Weekly, Ben's locally owned newspaper. Listeners tune in to find out how to deal with our new normal. This week, we are chatting with Kate Fitzpatrick. She recently became executive director of the Deschutes River Conservancy after working there for 16 years. The DRC works to restore stream flows in the Deschutes Basin through a unique collaborative model between various interest groups, such as farmers, environmentalists, and irrigation districts. Kate earned her BS in geology from Colgate University, and then an MS in environmental studies from the University of Oregon. She also worked in outdoor education for five years in Breckenridge, Colorado. Kate, thanks for being on the show with us today. Thank you, Aaron and Laurel. It's great to be here. Any chance to talk about water? Well, there's a lot of it coming down, so I feel like this is a good day to, to venture into this subject. Um, so congrats on your new job as executive director. Um, tell us how you became interested in this kind of work and, and what it's like running the show as a new ED remotely and those challenges. Yeah, yeah. How much time do we have? Um, so yeah, I, I grew up as a water baby on Michigan lakes, and I think that's where I was infused with this passion for water. Um, and I just grew increasingly interested in solving environmental problems as I moved through high school and college. Um, I was a bit more, um, at the time, obsessed with being outside and, and not being around people. So I spent summers living in my Toyota truck on national forest lands and doing habitat restoration work and leading wilderness trips, um, which was fabulous. But then I, when I went back to grad school at University of Oregon, I became increasingly compelled by the opportunity to solve those problems um, within communities and how interesting that would be to bring those diverse perspectives together to tackle what some people call our, our wicked natural resource uh, problems. Um, and for a while in graduate school, I was really um, interested in forestry collaboratives, how do, commun how do communities manage forests together? Um, there was a particular case on the west coast of Vancouver Island in an iconic rainforest that there was a lot of forest battles around the Oregon, not the Oregon, the um, spotted owl at the time. And, you know, I was just really intrigued by the narratives. You had the, the timber industry was calling this a resource and it was really about board feet and the environmentalists were actually chaining themselves to trees at that time. And um, they were trying to preserve the untouchable um, and, and keep it untouched. And then you had the indigenous people that had a different narrative of home and they'd been there for thousands of years and they were, um, you know, it wasn't that it's untouchable and it wasn't that it's just a resource, but they had always survived culturally and economically um, and spiritually off this forest. And so that really struck me of how can we shift the narratives from sort of untouched um, and uh, on one hand and extractive on the other hand and really, you know, become stewards of our landscape. So. Um, that really drew me to this job in Bend around water. I knew, um, had a passion for water, but knew nothing about water rights. But I see this as a community where you're really changing from, you know, an extractive history based on diverting and using water um, towards a recreational community. Like let's, let's play in our woods and along our rivers. But, but I'm really interested in how can we, um, is there a third way that's maybe more of a stewardship way where we can, you know, survive economically in a landscape while also recreating in it, stewarding it, and really just being more of a part of it. Um, Kate, was it, was it the, the position at the DRC that drew you to Bend? It was. I was that rare person that came to Bend for a job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a lucky one. You didn't have to uh, move here for mountain biking and then find some way to sustain right. it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so that's how I ended up here. That was about 16 years ago and um, kind of been through all different positions at the DRC. So I've learned a lot, of, a lot of different aspects about water rights, water management, collaboration. So in your new position, how, um, <clears throat> how are you communicating with your crew? How, I, I mean, this is, it's hard to do a podcast, let alone collaborate on water issues in this fashion. Yeah. It's amazing how busy you can be and never, you know, never getting out of your sweatpants and leaving your <laughs> kitchen. Table. I mean, um, I almost forget about it because we've just had to adapt, right? And, and yeah. our work, especially as yours is, it's so meeting-based, relationship-based, collaborative. Um, and we're just, we're still doing it. We're just doing it off of Zoom and it's almost become the new normal. But I'm, 
certain something's lost in there. So I'm very, yeah. um, very anxious to get back to the people meetings. We've had, you know, we'll take our little chairs to Drake Park with our blankets and every once in a while we'll do that or we'll huddle by the cinnamon spires. But by and large, um, you know, and also we're trying to run a, a water collaborative that has 40 or 50 people in it that we launched uh, this year during COVID. So um, we've been doing it, but I, I only expect that we'll be able to do it better when we get through this. It feels a little bit like the collaborative model is kind of, a, um, I mean, it's certainly it's time because with the pressures that are being put on, it's not so much people like, I think when you say collaborative, a lot of times people think, oh, that's a nifty thing I'd like to join and sign up for when really the way the pressures are on resources and uses and the, the groups that you named, they kind of have to come to, they have to start like in, it's like me early mediation like you know we don't want to end up in court mm -hmm. yeah there's all different reasons why people collaborate right but that's the yeah. main one is can we avoid conflict um, right and that tension between the time and patience it does take um as well as really needing to make progress on the decisions yeah so one of the things that i um i mean it's like i was thinking about it when we were having you on it was it's kind of like the moonshot of uh conservation here that photo that came up of wiki up reservoir that where it ran dry this summer and mm -hmm. um you know everybody knows the name wiki up reservoir people may be able to point to it on a sign but nobody really understands its importance and no one had seen it in that fashion it's like a picture is worth a thousand words and i'm wondering if that has um how how that's energize or invigorated your organization and what that means for um, future of irrigation or rivers? Yeah, so if, if it's okay, I think I'm gonna have to step back in time a little bit to tell the sure. story of how we ended up at that moonshot and, and with the reservoir. Um, the long story short, we've been working on these issues for a long time and, and they're nothing new. What you saw in Wikia, um, you know, really was heightened by several years of extreme drought and some changes in management of the river. But this is a problem and a legacy problem we've lived with for a long time. So if you step back to really the late 1800s, um, you know, the federal government was in an era of paying people, you know, giving them land, come west, make the desert bloom. It was this very settler draw, um, and at the same time the state was giving out uh, the rights to use water for what they were calling beneficial use in our basin that was mostly agriculture. Um, just to stop and pause that the public owns the water but they issue water rights to use the water. Sure. That's an important distinction. Uh, and then the federal government um, poured money into building you know, huge irrigation districts to convey this water 70, 100 miles to the desert. Um, and so that's that really, was one of the reasons we have Central Oregon communities today was based on that settlement. Um, and at the time, if you got here in 1897 and you got a water right then, then that's an old water right. And then it goes down the line from there. Um, so what the state inadvertently did was they gave away more rights to use the water in the river than exist in the river in some summer months. And that's called over allocation. So, you know, just to bring it home, like if you have a priority date on your water right of 1900, you're pretty good. You're probably gonna get your water most years. Um, 1913, which seems like a long time ago, you're kind of out of luck. You're always facing scarcity issues. And that's, um, so that's why, you know, there wasn't enough natural flow in the river. So then a series of dams were built again with federal funding and support. So that built um, Crane Ferry Reservoir, but we're really gonna focus on Wikia Reservoir today. Um, and I think 1958, it was finished. And that uh, holds back an extra 200,000 acre feet. So a lot of water um, to support the, the irrigation district with the, the worst water, right? The 1913 water right, since they aren't met by the river on a regular basis. Um, so that changed management of the river even more, right? So now you've got, um, in the wintertime, you're, you know, historically shutting down that river with just a trickle so that you can store that water for agriculture. And then in the summer, you release all that water, but then most of it was diverted just downstream of the bend. And so then you've got dry, almost dry streams downstream of bend. So you've created a, a situation that has drastically altered flows in the river. Um, because in 1900, even in 1950s, not a lot of people were thinking about the health of the river. Um, so we have a very rigid water 
law and policy system and we have changing values. Um, so not until 1987 did our state legislature say that you could protect water for the river's sake and stream. And that gave us a whole suite of tools to be able to kind of catch up and put more water in the river. Um, and that led to, in part, to the formation of the DRC to put those tools in place. Um, so, so generally the flow issues in our rivers um, are longstanding issues that we've been working with for a very long time. Drought is making that worse. You know, I think we're in the second or third year of extreme drought. You wouldn't know it by looking at the snowpack, but our aquifers is dry, not dry, but it, it needs to be recharged. Yeah. Um, and climate change is just gonna make all these uh, issues worse. So it does put a finer point on it. And I think to your point, it brought attention to the public in a way where um, average person in Bend doesn't see these issues because they're either downstream in the summer or way upstream in a snowy area in the winter where they're not going. And so I think the pictures of Wikia, um, some of the lava, uh, lava island falls fish kill that happens in October, mm -hmm. that's really brought a lot of these issues to the public's eye for the first time. So Let's go back and talk about why the DRC was founded and how the collaborative approach works, because there's quite a few environmental organizations focused on river health in Central Oregon, but the DRC is really unique. So could you tell us that story? Yeah, I would love to, Laurel, and it's one of the things that really keeps me drawn to the DRC. Um, it was really a unique um, set of individuals back in the 90s, early 90s, that had this foresight to come together and think about this stuff. So it was really driven by the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs Reservation. Um, so the reservation, as most of you know, is downstream of us, but the tribes also have rights to ceded lands that cover most of the Deschutes Basin um, and rights to fishing and hunting and gathering and the right to clean water, really. So um, they worked with Environmental Defense Fund to assess what are the biggest natural resource issues we should be worried about down the road. And uh, water quality and water quantity became those two top things for the tribes. And so they worked with irrigation district leaders and the environmental community um, to say, hey, what if we formed a group where we could actually do work together? Um, I think they were probably looking south to the Klamath water crisis and saying, let's not do that. Let's not repeat the Oregon Oregon, the spotted owl wars. Um, let's learn from this and stay ahead of conflict and work together. So that vision led to the DRC. Um, at the time, we were authorized by Congress um, with the help of Senator Mark Hatfield, and we had designated multi-diverse um, stakeholders on our board, and we had to operate by consensus. So to get anything done, everybody had to agree which as you can imagine with water rights is <laughs> not right. the easiest or right. expedient process, but you know, there was some, some low hanging fruit. And I mentioned we had some new tools that the state gave us to protect water and stream. Um, and we started to work with the irrigation districts and others on putting projects in place. Um, and all these projects restored flows, but they also supported irrigation district operations. Um, and they also, you know, created benefits in many ways. And so, it, it became a model that actually showed that it could work. Um, that Kate, was so what are, what are some of the challenges of the collaborative model? I mean, it, you also take some criticism for the fact that on serious issues, you can get caught as a collaboration breaks down in a, in a tug of war between parties. And usually you guys are mm -hmm. kind of looked to to moderate that kind of thing, which can be uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> What, uh, can you speak to that? I mean, as people look for, you know, why you might have these challenges with that model as well? Yeah, of course. It's an incredibly challenging model. I think it's, it's a superpower model, but it has its kryptonite to it. Right. And I think, you know, I always think about ovals, like, oh, you know, we have to work where the interests converge. And so if you have, like, if you're just concerned about river health, you're here. And if you're just concerned about, you know, irrigation district operations, you're here, but there is this place where they overlap and it's that place where we can operate within. Um, so when you're not meeting, you know, some of the other river needs or you're not fully meeting irrigation interest needs, you get hammered from all sides. But um, in our basin, I believe we're lucky enough to have enough opportunity and enough water and enough history that there is a significant amount that we can do together. But it's incredibly challenging. You know, I, I have uh, an amazing board of directors, but there are 15 individuals with 
totally different interests. Um, and they all have to answer to those interests as well as the DRC interest. So that makes for some interesting meetings. Um, but I think, um, well, I was gonna go to the rosy side, but I'll, I'll stay with the challenges. Don't go rosy on us yet, Kate. <laughs> stay, stay with the, your complex board and, and, those, and those coffee conversations. Yeah, <laughs> there's some ways that we work, we work through the challenges. But yeah, the challenges, um, you know, there has to be a reason to collaborate or else somebody wouldn't be at the table. And so we're always looking for what are, the, what are those reasons to make it worthwhile? Um, in the case of water, you know, irrigation districts historically have the power, right? They have the water rights. And so you kind of have to make sure that they like what you're doing. Um, okay, don't are... you, don't you also, aren't you also under a little bit of sandy footing politically? I mean, also your organization may enter into a collaborative model with a certain understanding about how environmental law and rule is going to go forward. And then it can shift with another administration or a senator might get unseated. I mean, we've been pretty stable here, relatively stable, but how does that play in? Yes, if I'm, if I'm understanding your, your question, it's not so much about the collaborative model, but how politics influence our world and shift the landscape. Well, I, I think it can happen. I think it can affect the collaborative model as well. I'm thinking about the river issues that they deal with in Southern Oregon with the salmon and on the Klamath and, mm -hmm. and how they'll come to a collaborative agreement and then mm -hmm. there'll be some political winds blowing or one of those entities gets a little more political power. And it's like, I don't know if I want this organ, this, treaty to hold for yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, that's a great, and the Klamath is a perfect example where they had this great agreement that right. went sideways. We have been luckier so far in the Deschutes. I feel like the, the area we've worked in, which is funding large-scale conservation projects, you know, water marketing, those have had um, unique bipartisan support in Congress. You know, even in the Trump era, our, our you know, the budget for the Bureau of Reclamation, one of our major funders um, did, did really well. Um, and that you know our basin was able to attract 150 million dollars for piping projects, and so um, there is a real risk of that with environmental issues. But we've been somewhat somewhat insulated from that. I would say, like the Endangered Species Act. I know that some of the federal agencies had very different um, sure different internal workings during the Trump era versus now what they'll have during the Biden era. But there were no real significant changes that that I saw happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, are there some some of those ideas that you guys have come up with, like water marketing and leasing? How are those successful, or are there still challenges with state law kind of mm -hmm. blocking the implementation of that? Um, yes, to both of those. So we have a longstanding, just for example, um, in stream leasing program we've had in place for over a decade, uh, where you simply provide an incentive to a water rights holder and they'll put that water in stream temporarily. So when you look at the middle Deschutes and the bend in the summer, about a third of that water is from that leasing program. Super flexible tool, the, the water right holder retains their water right, gets beneficial use for it, um, but really impactful. So that's been really successful. Um, what we're doing right now is trying to grow that program into different ways. And so, we're trying to increase the amount of water that people are leasing. And we're actually trying to, I mentioned that uh, equity between districts with senior and junior priority dates. So we're, we're actually trying to create programs that incentivize um, patrons who have enough water to move that water to North Unity Irrigation District that's got severe scarcity, um, literally on the brink of survival in some cases, um, in exchange for releasing that water out of Wikiup in the upper Deschutes. So what's really different about this from both a cultural and a legal perspective is those districts historically were siloed. Each irrigation district did their own thing and now they're working together. And so they're making great progress on that, but it's not, um, it's new and it's not easy. And you're dealing with different irrigation district boards um, and you're dealing with state water policy that I feel like we have some of the tools we need, but it's stretching the envelope a little bit. Um, I see in the future um, maybe being able to affect policy in a way where the Deschutes, if we had broad consensus around how we wanted to move water, maybe could do things a little more flexibly within water law than we can currently do it. So um, let's go oh. ahead. Oh, okay. I just I was going to steal your question, Laurel, but you, you go you go forward. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, the source ran an article a couple of months ago about the Habitat Conservation Plan, 
And, um, you know, it could end up shielding irrigation districts from liability if endangered species go extinct. So it's a pretty big deal. Could you give us a little background on what the HCP is and, and most importantly, where is the process right now? Sure, yeah. Um, first of all, what the HCP does is, is do, does not um, sort of exonerate anyone if a species goes extinct. And so um, I think the main point there, the federal agencies that issue the permit, um, they would not issue a permit if there is a chance of the species going extinct. And if they're wrong and, and all those things start to happen, there's a bunch of tools they can put in place along the way to revisit the conservation measures with, with the applicants and the, the permit holders. So all that's a lot of jargon. So let me step back and say, um, a habitat conservation plan is a voluntary process that um, like in this case, the irrigation districts and the city of Primeville undertook because it started with um, reintroduced steelhead in the basin 12 years ago. Um, so for the first time, steelhead was reintroduced above, um, up into the upper basin, pretty big deal and uh, kind of scary for people in Prineville, for example. And so they wanted to make sure that they could um, continue their activities, um, but not you know, put some conservation and measures in place to ensure they're helping the species and continue on with their operations. And so what, it, what the um, incidental take permit does or the habitat conservation plan is um, in exchange for an agreed upon set of conservation measures and actions, then the districts have reduced uh, liability under the Endangered Species Act. Um, but there are checkpoints along the way and it's not sort of a free pass to make a species go extinct. Now that said, there's been a high level of controversy around this as you are aware and as you <laughs> picked up in your story. Um, and this, you know, the controversy only increased with the listing of the Oregon Spotted Frog in 2014 under the Endangered Species Act and through the Upper Deschutes uh, geography in the spotlight for the very first time. And the Upper Deschutes geography between Bend and upstream to Wiki up about 72 miles, um, it's really a reach that has lost function due to the management of that storage and release of irrigation water. Um, but it was a really hard part it was a hard thing to work on and it was um, really risky for those junior water rights holders to try to address that issue. And so while we were making progress in other areas, that was sort of a, a stubborn area where we weren't making any progress. Um, and Kate, just, just for emphasis, because I think you hit it right there for listeners, is that junior, if the water, if, if water is kept, the junior, the junior water right holders will lose out. They will not get their water because there won't be enough water in the river to allocate. Yes, so every drop of water in that reservoir is for that North Union Irrigation District. Mm -hmm. And they, um, just to drive this point home, you know, they use on average, um, you know, they're engaged in productive agriculture, probably the most productive in the basin. And they use on average a third of the water that other waters, water users use. So they sure. can't really go any lower. <laughs> yeah. um, and so the big play is to share water from the, the more senior districts to them from the river, and then they won't need that stored water and they can release it. So it's a little complex, but it's basically like just balancing out the water availability for the districts so that um, the upper Deschutes River can be restored. Right, but, and, but to understand the stresses behind it with the HCP, had, you know, how that th whatever gets determined for in-stream flows means they might have to do less, they might get less water. And especially if we see, like you were saying, benchmarks are going along and, oh, it looks like the, the frog ain't making it, mm -hmm. then they'll be asked to put more water in the back in the river. Is that correct? Um, possibly, yeah. Um, and again, I, mean, I don't want to just stick on all the dark things that could happen no, around this. <laughs> I think what is unique about this is that the, I mentioned that the irrigation districts used to be like silos and now they're coordinating. Mm -hmm. um, so the whole HCP plan is based on um, the senior irrigation districts, you know, sharing, I say sharing, but there's probably, you know, incentives involved that water with North Unit so that they're not going to bear the whole burden themselves. And so that's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting situation because these districts, um, the senior districts really, you know, it's not their reservoir that's driving those changes, but yet they're sort of at the table helping figure this out um, sure. because they can, they have the opportunity to do that. And so it is kind of a, um, 
you know, we all get grumpy about slow progress, but it's a pretty innovative model of solving water in a complex fashion. Um, and then to your point, so what does that habitat conservation plan actually do in the upper Deschutes and where is it and what does that mean for our work? Um, it was just signed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in December 31st, <laughs> like at midnight or something. Um, and then there's, there's a companion piece with the um, NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service related to steelhead and they haven't signed their piece yet. They're just a couple months behind, but the frog piece is in place um, and it does lay out targets, um, flow targets over time that the irrigation districts have to meet. And so this is, um, you know, there is debate over are they high enough targets and are they fast enough? Um, this is the very first time we've had committed flow targets in the upper Deschutes River. And so just for perspective, I know cubic feet per second doesn't mean a whole lot, but just look at the numbers here. Like since 1958, there was a minimum of 20 cubic feet per second. Um, historically, it would have been like six to 800. Um, as of 2014, we've had 100. And within seven years, we'll have triple that. We'll have 300. So that's a significant um, foundation to build on that we're just excited to kind of get working with our partners to help them meet those goals and help do that. Um, okay, do, you, do you sometimes feel like, um, I mean, I know it's somewhat of a modern ethos that everybody kind of wants things really fast. You know, like mm -hmm. we expect change, you know, if we, if we get upset about something, we want to protest it. We want, you know, there to be some action based on that. And mm -hmm. I mean, could there, I mean, I don't want to overstate this, but there, could there be anything that moves more slowly than water regulation? <laughs> I, I mean, it really is glacial. I mean, we're talking about 1890. I mean, the kind of things I don't, I don't think, I, I know for me when I first came to this subject and was um, starting to report on it and edit it, there's, <clears throat> You, you just start realizing how um, monumental small change is in this area. And I think people are like, well, you know, we didn't get quite get the flow we wanted, um, but it's like people on your side of the um, river, I think say, man, look around, like we haven't had this kind of change in what, 50 years, maybe mm -hmm. more. So I'm, can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, trying to get pe listeners mindsets around like, what does this look like in terms of pace? <laughs> I guess I would agree with you that water <laughs> management moves at an incredibly glacial pace. Um, but you know, it, this water rights appropriation system has been in place for 150 years. So it's gonna take a couple decades to sort out. Now there are ways to push it faster, you know, but then I even look at things like lawsuits that would maybe create some faster changes. Like you look at the Klamath and there's been lawsuits for decades and there's been no progress. So right. I'm, not, I'm not sold that that's gonna expedite things. Um, but I do think, yeah, being able to triple the flows and actually, you know, it's meeting the originally set in-stream water rate by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, you know, in seven years, um, after trying to work on this for 16 years, that does feel like sometimes it feels fast. Um, <laughs> is that enough? Can it go faster? I mean, certainly we could we could argue that all day. Um, well, I think water rights across the West. I mean, and, and it's a it's a. I mean, a lot of people like think it's state, but it, you know, like well, Oregon will fix will fix the Deschutes, you know where a lot of these things have reverberations that will carry all the way over to Colorado. Like none of this is going to get changed at a, some of the more fundamental things like taking a water right from somebody. That's not mm -hmm. the kind of thing that you can be done like that. No, I do think that we're going to be entering a new era where you're going to start to see more systematic shifts. I think, I think that the current structure of water law and policy is completely ill-equipped to handle what's coming down the pipe as far as climate change, population growth, changing values. It's just not going to be adequate. Um, so what does that mean? I mean, I think it's an exciting time for sort of basin-wide water management. If you can take that time, the hard time of getting agreement in one basin on how to do something, you could maybe set an example of like, here's how you do it. And it's probably not going to work for the Umatilla or the Colorado but maybe there's some lessons on um, how that collaboration can create basin specific plans that could work. 
And so I could see, you know, trying to create more flexibility in the water rate system um, on a regional basis, on a basin by basin basis, which is totally different than how it's ever been done. But I just don't think that um, the current system is going to be able to handle what's being asked of it in the coming decades. Well, I think people demand a faster timeline now, whether they get it or not. There's an expectation there's going to be more movement. Um, mm -hmm. We're running out of time, but I wanted to just touch base on piping. And I know we could have done this whole podcast on piping, but um, one of the, you know, the fact that uh, citizens are ponying up more dollars, there's really a lot of taxpayer dollars now. And I feel like people are asking questions about piping for the first time. I mean, we live in an area that's completely cut up with uh, canals and irrigation districts have coverage over most of the area. But for the person who's moving to Bend and maybe they're going to Fred Meyer and they drive over the canal and they think, well, that's a, what's that empty rocky you know, river right there? Um, do you feel that there's a little more I don't know, awareness of the importance that, that canals play in our region and what piping means for people. And is that a good conservation area? I know I'm not giving you, I'm going to give you a lot with only a couple of minutes left. <laughs> um, gosh, where does it start? So uh, as far as the conservation measure, yeah, we have um, a, like a absolutely porous basalt geology here. So when you put water down a canal, you lose up to 50% of it. It goes to groundwater, but you don't see it in that river until you get to Lake Billy Chinook. So you've, um, you've taken twice as much out of the river as you need to get to the farm. So as a conservation measure, yes, piping makes all the sense in the world. If you're living in a, you know, a canals in your backyard and you like the water feature, yeah, I understand why that's a bummer. Um, I think it's, it's about education and learning about the trade-offs of, you know, if you have a canal in your backyard and some duck habitat, what have you lost as far as fish habitat in the river? Um, it's a very expensive solution. It's always been a part of our portfolio of projects, but we've always tried to integrate large piping with other projects, water marketing, sure. on-farm efficiencies. So that's what, you know, that's what we're really driving for is to create the programs where you can take, you know, those huge slugs of water that get saved and put in stream from piping, and then you can optimize with lower cost projects and voluntary incentive-based programs to capture even more water to solve problems. Um, so I don't know if that answers your, your question in a nutshell. But. No, yeah, and, and I'm just curious. I know there's been, um, there's been a lot of discussion about con piping versus conservation, you know, like the monies that we're putting out to pipe the canals. Is it, is it achieving for the dollar the same conservation that we could see for less grand, bring out the bobcat type of yeah. projects? Yeah, you know, yes and no. I think um, it's a it's an easy fix for the districts, even though it's not easy. They put so much energy into these sure. projects, but it's easy because they own the canal and they have sort of decision making authority. Um, for example, COID is going to be piping a thirty million dollar project in two years. We'll have thirty CFS more in the upper Deschutes. That's a huge result. Um, it's also a huge price tag. So what we really are working on with the districts is, is all of those things. And so if you could have a pipes fully pressurized system that makes it to the on-farm and you can convert from flood to sprinkler for lower cost, and then you can, um, you know, leasing water is really cost effective. That will allow us to lease more water because it's a pipe system that's easier to control. All those things work together. Um, so what we're really hoping for is to complement the large pipe with you know, all those other programs that you're thinking of that can sure. save water. And I think there's an ethic that needs to, there needs to be more education and change around, um, around water conservation and that you have a, a responsibility as a water rights user to steward that water and to use it as efficiently as possible. And if we can help bring grant dollars to help you do that, we're absolutely willing to do that. But I think that's why, you know, one of the reasons I appreciate being on here today is, is the public really needs to understand what's going on, what the problems are, what the solutions are, because it's complicated, right? But the more the public understands, you know, public opinion, it does matter. And it is one of those things that can help accelerate this work. Well, I have been encouraged by the fact that now that there is these $30 million, $24 million, I think, I, I can't remember what the other budget was for the piping and TID, but um, it does raise visibility, of course, because people are going to ask, like, is that a good use of my my funds. And mm -hmm. Kate, I really appreciate you coming on the um, podcast today and explaining this. I, I think I can 
say this for Laurel and all other journalists covering water issues and getting into CFS and government regulation, it makes everybody's head swim. And uh, it is so complex and, and uh, appreciate the work you're doing in this area. Thank you. I hope I didn't gloss over anybody's eyes, but I'm um, always happy to talk about water and for people who want to learn more, just get in touch with us. We would love to love to talk more. So thanks for covering this. Great. Thank thanks you for, so much, Kate. Thanks for being here, Kate.